most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with the accomplished Dr. Christina Rum. Dr. Rum is a well-known healthcare executive, scientific researcher, innovator, entrepreneur, and author with a wealth of experience across multiple industries. She founded and led several successful ventures, including the Wolf Brands, CMT Holdings, Rem Medical LLC, Q The Causes Inc., and Doc NDC2 Holdings. Good morning, Dr. Ram. It's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. You are the founder of the Woods Brands. Can you share with us your journey and how you ended up in the healthcare industry? Absolutely. Thank you, first of all, for having me on today. And just to share a little bit, yeah, about my journey. Um, I, you know, I, I had a master's of science and my first doctorate degree was in psychology and counseling, but I ended up uh, getting pregnant and I um, I got very sick, actually. I ended up during the pregnancy, they knew that there was different types of cancer and um, I lost one of the twins and I also mm-hmm. developed a prolactinoma and brain tumor afterwards, um, cancer throughout, like behind my eye right here. Um, I also had a, a spinal tumor and a lot of things because it metastasized throughout my body. So then I started being very focused on science instead of just psychology. Um, I ended up working with pharmaceutical and biotech, and I started studying a lot of natural things through that process because I didn't want to just do pharmaceutical. Um, I've traveled to 87 countries, so I've been exposed to Eastern and Western medicine. I've been uh, Africa, South Africa, the Middle East, Asia. I've been all over. So I knew for myself, I didn't just want to go to a doctor. I wanted to research and find out what was the best stance for me. And through that, I started really studying zeolites. I started really studying spirulina and chlorella and algaes and different things that could help detox and basically suppress tumors and support the good cells in your body. Um, So this just led me to go back to school. I ended up getting multiple PhDs as well as um, postdoc in nanobiotechnology and certification in nutritional counseling and pharmaceuticals from Um, from Cornell and Harvard. But it really was because I really wanted to provide solutions for different people, right? And because I I knew that I had this ability to really understand science and to develop new things. And so that led me to really understanding that I needed to not just cure things or help things when people got sick, but to support their bodies in a period of wellness and to continuously detox people and to supplement their bodies with what they needed because, you know, this body is the only house you'll ever have. I mean, you, you can travel all over the world like I do or move houses, but this is what you're stuck with, right? So you got to take care of it. And I feel like, you know, in all these other countries I've visited, they understood natural things can help you. In the United States, I didn't feel like we understood it as much. And I'm very thankful to the pharmaceutical and biotech industry But I really believe that my mission, and it started when I was 24, 25 years old when I got really sick, my mission was to really help people understand traditional and non-traditional, to incorporate natural products and not just synthetic products. And I feel blessed that I've had this opportunity to do this now. And The Root Brands is in 76 countries. We grew that fast over two and a half years. And, um, And I think it's because we really do care about people. We support emotional, mental, spiritual and physical health, you know, because we're, we're a ball of energy. So we have all yes. these things inside we've got to support. But now I'm very curious to know, how did you, how did you cure your cancer? So I had, when the prolactinoma brain tumor happened, um, they were going to do a surgery. They were going to do a surgery on uh, the pituitary gland. And um, I said, can I have three months before you do the surgery? Because I want to try some natural things. And they said, yes. And I did. And I did these green shakes, which are a lot like we have this product called Relive Greens that I worked on. But I actually worked on it in my 20s. And now we have a product now that's very similar. I sourced ingredients from all over the world. I I did tons of research on how do you get rid of brain tumors. And so I 
did this morning, noon, and night. I stopped eating everything. I stopped drinking alcohol or caffeine. I just did these shakes, which tasted horrible, to be honest with you at first. <laughs> but then it really, I started thinking, I started, it's like anything when you start feeling better, you start liking something because I realized at that point, I need to eat and drink to live and not live. You know, I, I need, this needs to be something more important than just the taste of something. So I ended up loving the spiraling, the shakes and the zeolites I was taking and all the different things that were natural. Uh, I really lived, I mean, I got very, very skinny, to be honest. I lived just on things that were helping me detox the things out and supplement it. Cause I had this gut feeling. I started researching fungus and I started understanding that fungus is a precursor to cancer. And I knew genetically I was exposed to a lot of heavy metals because I grew up on a farm where there's lots of pesticide. So I understood that I've got to get these things out of my body and I've got to support the good things. And if you look at cancer cells, they talk, right? That's why they communicate with each other. That's why they grow. Because what happens with cancer is the cells go in and they talk to each other. And they say, you need to look like me through their different pathways. They really do. Through the IL-4, IL-2 pathways, they, they're talking and saying, you need to look like me. You need to grow. The tumor needs to grow or the cancer needs to grow. And I knew I needed to cut off that communication. And I wanted to try natural first. I would have done the surgery, by the way. And I did do surgeries, a mole surgery behind my eye and around my nose with the cancer. I chose to go ahead and, and cut um, on those surgeries. But on the brain tumor, I was nervous because I was worried that I wouldn't be able to think as well if something happened during the surgery. And so that's what I did. And that got, you know, got me better. And actually, two years ago, I ended up having five cancer cells again. I have four basal and one squamous on my face. And against everyone's uh, desire, including my mother's and my friends and the doctor, I, instead of choosing 30 rounds of radiation, I again chose to do natural things to help my skin. That doesn't work with everyone. But for me, understanding my body and the research, that's what I did for myself. Now, my dad had cancer, which was stage four, head, neck, and throat, stage four, advanced. And he did chemotherapy, radiation, just one round of the original treatment, and then did natural products. So everyone's different, but that's how I helped myself. My goal was to figure out what was causing this in my body. Why was cancer continuing to grow in my body? And how did I shut off the communication so the cancer cells stopped talking and stopped growing and the healthy st cells took over? And I, I, I'm going to tell you this too. I did a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, a lot of really focusing positive energy on the rest of my life. And I actually made a lot of promises to myself of if I could get better, what would I do for the rest of my life? And that's, that's why for me, this is a mission <laughs> instead of just a casual thing, because I promised myself when I was at the age of 25. Oh my goodness. This is an amazing story. But you know, one thing that I am, um, for the, for the brain tumor, is that actually gone now? You don't have that anymore? So I went in to do the surgery and they wanted to do a scan the day before and it wasn't there. Uh, they couldn't find it. And so, um, they, you know, they had me come back three months later and then six months. And then for years, I had to be tested every year. Now I don't. Um, I actually am doing a scan this Thursday because they just want to give a look at everything. But um, I don't go like they don't have me go back because it's not there. And the syringomyelia that was in my spine actually came back when I was pregnant with my daughter. And they recommended a medical abortion right away because of the fact they thought I would die if I had her. Uh, and I was actually exposed to two rounds of nuclear toxins and isotopes because they were doing scans and didn't know I was pregnant. And I didn't know I was pregnant. And so when they realized that I was at Vanderbilt and they recommended again to, to get rid of the pregnancy because they didn't think the baby would make it or I would make it. So that was my second pregnancy that that happened with basically. And I again chose to have the baby. Again, it was just a personal choice. I'm, I'm big into personal choices, to be honest, for women. And I, it was a personal choice that I wanted to have this child, although I was torn about it because as a scientist and a doctor, I, I was worried she wouldn't be okay and I wouldn't be okay. But she's actually a wonderfully perfect. My daughter, she's now 17. My oldest child that I was had cancer with is 27. And so again, these were choices because I really do understand. I 
not to get too sentimental into this, but I believe there's only one person I answer to in, in heaven. And I, I believe that <laughs> I, I believe there's and, and and I know different religions term that differently. But for me, I'm here for a reason. This is my body and I have to be the owner of my body and not let just a medical professional tell me what to do. Even though I do respect greatly doctors and the profession, I still believe you have to make the right decision for your own body. Would you say that, um, would you advise people to look into not just chemotherapy and not just surgeries, but also look at alternatives to be able to create a balance for themselves? I do. I always say this, you know, health is about greatness, not just about when you get sick. So you've got to look at wellness, greatness, nutrition, supplements that are natural and not just putting synthetic drugs into your body. Again, those are needed, right? Like medicine has saved our world. Like we've done some great things with medicine. However, to me, it shouldn't be the first option. And and to me, it should be honestly the last. If you get sick, I think you need to incorporate both. I think it's very important. The problem is a lot of the doctors in Europe and the United States have not studied a lot of natural medicine. If you were raised or you grew up in you know, Nigeria, Ghana, Malaysia, different countries, they're used to natural things because they don't just write scripts for everything. But because I've been to all those places and spent lots of time in those places, I've been exposed to both. And I think one of my missions in life is not just to talk about people empowering their own bodies and taking care of their bodies, and but also incorporating Western, Eastern, traditional and non-traditional medicine. I don't think you should just go to the doctor and do a surgery or do chemotherapy and not do the other stuff too. I think you need to do both. Yes, do both. So now you travel all around the world, if I may say so myself. <laughs> uh, you've been to countries that more um, care about themselves than medication, which is that's something I truly believe on. Um, if I have a headache, you tell me, go take an uh, Advil. I'm going to look at you like, no, nah. I'm going to get my ginger and I'm going to make myself a tea yes. and I'm going to drink that. I'm going right. to go to sleep. And when I wake up, I'm going to feel a lot better. So that yeah. is my way of looking at life. So now you started your own company. With all the research, all of the things that you use for yourself. So now, how are you using all of them within your company to support others? So, you know, I tell people this all the time. When I source products to make them in a lab, you know, people respected me a great deal when I worked for pharmaceutical and biotech because they think it's harder to make a human monoclonal antibody or do an investigator-sponsored trial with the FDA than it is to do natural products. But it's actually not true. Um, they're both complicated if you do them the right way. The problem is there's all these supplements out there that, the, in my opinion, they don't do the right way. I source the ingredients from different places throughout the world. I try to make sure the seeds and the plants and the oils are and the roots of the plants are not exposed to GMOs and they're pure. Because the truth is that you can have something organic that was around a lot of toxins years ago that are still in the plants. So I even mm. try to source the parent plants and, and understand where their ge genealogy is. I know that sounds odd, but it's true because whatever we put in our body, it's got to have the nutrients and minerals that we need. You can buy an orange right now and it not have any vitamins and minerals because of how much we haven't protected our land, air, and water. So I'm extremely careful about where I source things. And then the processes I use, I do use nanotechnology. I don't put it into the product. I use it during the manufacturing process because my goal is to achieve bioavailability of the nutrients and minerals that are in the plants or seeds or oil or roots that are, of the things that I make. Um, and it's really important to me. I did patents, for example, that got rid of basically re regenerate basically the skin, hair and nails or reverse aging is some of the approvals that I that I received because my focus is always. How do we go into the body, communicate with the cells so that they that we clean the cells, so that we detox the cells and make them look more like a newborn baby cell? And then how do we make sure this is bioavailable throughout the body so that the body can use what we give it to support not just the autoimmune system, but also quality and quality and um, quantity of life? Like I want people to be able to live to be 130 and be beautiful and happy while they're doing it. So I really focused on that. So for example, 
For me, because I did these grains, I made a product for everyone because I know there's lots of people with autoimmune disorders and people that have cancer as well as people that are well and they just want to put good things into their body. So I did this drink. And then another thing I feel like was an extreme focus for me was I understood that our land, air and water is toxic and that we are too, which is why we keep getting sick. So COVID for me wasn't a big deal because I knew these kinds of things for years were going to happen because our environment is toxic. Our bodies are too. So uh, this detox cleansing product to help get rid of the heavy metals in the body and to help protect the inside was so important to me. And the Clean Slate is our by by uh, hands down our largest selling product throughout the world because it helps with that. And also, again, because when I did these products, I also looked at supporting mitochondria and telomeres so that people could look and feel and be younger. Um, that was my goal. And then I did a neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter serotonin product to support mental health, cognitive functioning, and performance. The first goal was to support sexual health for women. <laughs> that was my goal. And then as I started working on it, and I used microdosing of like pine bark, velvet bean, L-theanine, and vitamins and minerals in this product, we started getting outstanding test results from men and women and started tracking these case studies. And we even started doing case studies with autism, Alzheimer's, Asperger's, and had phenomenal, ADHD had phenomenal results. And so that product is called Zero N, and we've been able to help people all over the world. We got approved in the United States by BSVG, so we're approved by the Olympic committees, as well as all professional teams, and the same thing with Europe. And why that was important to me is I wanted athletes to be able to take these products And for someone to say, I didn't want anyone to say they were doping or that they were synthetic or that they weren't natural. And we got approval for that so that now anyone that's a professional athlete in Europe and the United States can use our products without any repercussion. But we have seen an increase in performance with athletes when they're on the products. Wow, this is amazing. So, you know, one thing uh, for your products, I feel like you are um, the example of the products because... um, so as looking at you, you look like you're about what, 24, 25? And then, thank uh, you. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, so actually, 24, 25. <laughs> See, I love you even more now. She was, Lisa wants to know how she looks. <laughs> so now I feel like I need to start taking the product so I can stay <laughs> here forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I have to tell you, I know it's probably not on the agenda to talk about today, but my other big mission is female empowerment. It's a huge for me. Yes. Um, I love empowering women because I feel like it's so important in our world. And um, I love when women feel better and look better. And of course, I love men too. So I'm not against men either. <laughs> but I just think it's really important because women are so hard on each other and we're nurturers, we're givers. And uh, we got to take care of our own body first or we can't take care of others. That's for sure. And I completely agree with you. And that also that as women too, we handle so many different things at once. We and uh, sometimes we forget about ourselves. Yeah, we do. Um, I, you know, I have to tell you that that's probably been one of the hardest things in my life is I do forget um, about myself. You know, I, I, I work over some weeks, over 100 hours a week. I'm trying to dial back on that because my travel schedule was so out of control that it was uh, it was really hard to to manage four children, my friends, family, and my life. And I really had to talk to myself. You know, sometimes you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, "Listen, you're important." You have to tell yourself. I tell people this all the time: look at your eyes in the mirror and say, "I love you." You're important because we forget and we can't show love to others unless we take care of ourselves. And I look at this as not a, it's not about me. It's about the fact that I have to take care of who I am again in order for me to take care of anyone else. Yes, I agree with you. We do need to do that. So now with all the products, I know that um, with all the products that you have, how can someone actually buy them? Where? So um, the products are available at the rootbrands.com. Um, and I don't know what, li- there's different links you have to use to get in. I know that Lisa Kreitz was going to send one over because the program's really different. It was developed uh, after an Amazon Prime model. And so it's not an MLM. It's not an affiliate, really. It's a model that is used to basically, you can refer 
and you can get discounts and everything. It was developed as a fintech system, to be honest, because my husband, Clayton Thomas, he he literally was looking at what he thought he projected was going to happen. This was three years ago. He felt this was before COVID. You know, he he felt like we were going to have a change in currency. He felt like we were moving towards digital currency and Bitcoin. And he knew that my platform was more international than in the United States, that I had traveled throughout the world and was working in all these, honestly, third world countries and different or, and different organizations with different governments. So he developed a system under the root brand so that people could be financially successful and profitable if they just developed businesses online. And uh, he was extremely successful in that. And, and another thing I think that he's been successful at, and I hope I've helped him with this, is we developed a community where we support people emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. We're really big into that. We believe that each person has something to contribute. In a time where we're talking about population management, we're talking in our group about sustainability and how do we take care of our own bodies and our own children. I spoke at the World Economic Forum about this in two talks on while, while everyone was talking about population management, I was talking about how do we improve our environment and how do we live longer, but live healthier? Because if you can cause people to put their energy into their own bodies and their own lives, they can c- contribute to society and to yes. our economy. It's when people give up and quit and don't work and don't take care of their own self. That you have problems. And that's when you hear governments talking about, well, we don't need so many people. If the people were producing, they wouldn't be saying that, right? And I do understand people get sick and we should always take care of our elderly. We should always take care of our children. We should always take care of the sick people. But if you're here and you're capable, I believe you have to contribute every day to what you're doing, which is why the root brands is so important. I own the products at the root brands. I, I license them to them from DRC Ventures. Um, and we do some private events as well and private like private labels and white labels. But the root brands, in my opinion, is this phenomenal system that not only helps people with health, but financial security and success. And right now, while everyone's worried about that, people in that community aren't because they're able to take in and give money through this financial system that's been created easily in all these countries. I think we're in 76 right now. Like I said, we're projected to go into 110 this year if possible. Wow. I wish that everyone would looked at it the way you do. I wish (laughs) that the people who's creating all these medications that's keeping us from being able to feel better. The way I see it, it's like I am. you have a kid that was born with one thing and that kid is in one medication and that kid become 15, double the medication. That kid become 21, triple the medication. Mm-hmm. And that kid keep getting more medication, more medication, more medication for the rest of that kid life. So really, that kid doesn't really need all that medication. No. So no. And they have side effects from the first medication. If you really would look at the package inserts and the disclosures and medication, they're very really small. <laughs> I know. I mean, okay, here's the benefit, but what are all the side effects? Let's read this. And no one wants to read the side effect profile because I'm going to tell you something that people have got to wake up about. They go to a doctor. A doctor prescribes a medication. And it does make them usually feel good for a while, right? It helps them. But they never, they don't want to read the side effect because they don't want to know what could happen. And they really don't. And I'm including very intelligent people. They want to just think, well, that doesn't apply to them. And the truth is it does apply to them because I worked in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry for years, loved the industry. I really was treated great, but I I knew there was a different path that I also needed to pursue um, because I did understand the side effect profiles and I understood how many people we helped. And I still understand, but I also understand some things were overprescribed, some things people didn't need. And, And then also every time I love what you just said is a child is on it, then it doubles. You know, people over the age of 70 are on usually anywhere from 7 to 17 medications, and they usually die from a slip and fall or from the side effects of the medication, but they don't read the side effects. And also, the doctors don't know the counterindications. So basically, if you're on Paxil, for example, you shouldn't be on Warfarin or Lipitor, but the doctors don't coincide and look at both labels. 
And that's actually a problem that I wish I could educate people on. Again, I'm not against medication, but if you looked at my drawer at my house and you opened it, there's tons of medication that's never been used. (laughs) So there's like all these doctors writing the medication. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to be on that for the rest of my life because I do understand um, the statistics. I understand that over 70% of the people that end up in the ER, they think they end up from a disease or something wrong with them, but a lot of it's the side effects from medication. So I'm very cognizant of that. I think you have to be on some medication when you have issues. But again, I think it's overprescribed, especially in the United States. So I'm glad you said that. <laughs> so I, um, after I give birth to my son, I end up with acne and fingers, which is in my face. So certain yeah. time I cannot wear makeup, my fist will start itching. And I saw a lot of doctors for that and no one could fix it. And each one of them I, I, I met, they give me a different medication, a different medication, a different medication. So now if you go to my house, I have a bunch of medication for it yeah. that I never <laughs> use. But what yeah. I find was that when I started using natural things, yeah, it's starting to clear out and my fist was getting a lot better and a lot better. So I end up making my own cream, my own things to clear out my fist. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of doctors, because they don't study. So when doctors go to medical school, they usually have about one class in pharmaceuticals, right? Or or, or in pharmacology. That's it. And so they don't understand that because you go when you go to medical school, you you go to diagnose and treat, but you don't study what are the interactions and contra interactions between these treatments And really, if you understand medical school and doctors, and this was hard for me to understand. I was a psychologist at first. I went to school for all these years. I went to three years for graduate school where I did oral and written comps and thesis. Then I went to get my doctorate degree, which was another five years plus a dissertation. I started seeing patients. And I remember, I'll never forget the first day and the first week I saw patients. And I was in mental health. So I would see 40 to 60, and I ended up being a supervisor over other psychologists. And I had to diagnose patients, and I was not prepared. And if you said to me, well, you went to school for all those years. Yes, I did. But what I didn't understand until I started practicing is I just made an educated guess. I made an educated guess based on what I knew and my knowledge, not understanding that everyone's DNA is different at the time. You know, I didn't understand all the different factors. And I was overwhelmed by that. I had to decide whether people went to the hospital or not. And I wasn't prepared. Doctors study how to diagnose based on a best guess scenario. So, for example, with multiple sclerosis, let me just use that. When you do a scan, you can see the plaques on the brain, but those could be something else, too. So that's why you could go to 10 doctors and they would all have a different diagnosis. And then the patients buy into that. Right. And then they live their life. Based on that diagnosis, instead of. Being strong enough to understand, don't live the life you're prescribed. Live the life you want. Stop listening to someone say you're going to get sick or you're not going to be okay. Don't do that. I really, I really wish I could share that with people. And I feel like I haven't been as successful as I wish I could be because it's really important that people understand that. It's just a diagnosis. It's a best guess from that doctor based on scans that someone developed over years ago to think that's a diagnosis. So for me, for example, when I go Thursday, they're doing scans and I really don't even want to go because based on how I believe they may give me a diagnosis of something. And you heard my history. The likelihood of me following that is pretty low because <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to figure out some other way. And it's worked for me so far. You know, I, I don't. I also, again, I mean, I, I want your audience to know I do understand when people are chem- on chemotherapy or radiation or medication. I really do. But people fall into this trap of just believing and whatever they're told and living whatever they're told. And then they stop their life short of who they could be. My biggest advice I give people all the time is work as long as you can. Be focused on helping people as long as you can, because you're here to contribute. Your life matters. Your mission matters. Your voice matters. So when someone tells you you're sick, guess what? Out, outdo that. Like, use your mind and outdo it. And I'm like you, like, take the ginger tea, take a nap, try that first. And then if you need to do something else, you have to. Um, I hate taking, like, Tylenol and Advil. I have to tell you, it's really hard for me to take. But I've taken stuff before when I fly. Like, my biggest fear is flying. 
So there are times that I can't naturally handle that. Um, and so I have, but I do not get in a habit of doing it because I don't want to be reliant on anything. And that's just my personality. But again, I hope your audience hears this. They are the biggest expert on their body. And people need to understand that. And they need to listen to those feelings and they need to stop being prescribed a diagnosis of you have X, right? And then living their life based on the fact that they're scared and they think they're sick. I really wish we could teach people not to do that. I hope so too. But one thing that you said, not the one you prescribe, which get, which get me to your first book, Kill the Causes, Live the Life You Want, not the one you, you prescribe. Yeah. Sounds very interesting. And I can't wait to read it, by the way. What inspired you to write that book? I, I think. I think I wanted people to understand, um, you know, most people that would look at my life probably wouldn't understand what I'd been through and that I look normal. Like I had Lyme disease when I was 19. Uh, I lost my memory. I actually forgot what two plus two was or my parents' name. I didn't even know where I lived. I ended up in the hospital for weeks. I did IV infusions. I lost my hair. I lost my eyelashes. Um, But I didn't quit. And one thing I'm thankful for are my parents. I thought they were hard on me at the time. They made me go back to school. The doctor was like, she cannot go back to school. And my parents were like, she's going back to school and she's going to do great. And I was extremely sick and I was embarrassed about the way I look. Um, But I did and I enjoyed school. I finished college um, despite being that sick, despite losing my memory. They ended up when I was in the hospital diagnosing me with meningitis. So I completely lost, you know, my ability. I had a photographic memory, couldn't remember anything, but I relearned it. And I became, I have the skill set now, which is an eidetic memory where I can basically take a, a, a screenshot of a page and remember everything that's on it in my mind. And I think that developed from losing a photographic memory. I developed another way of learning, even though I lost years of science and math where I used to be fantastic at it. I had to relearn everything. I even I think I failed or made a D in biology, which in 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 high school, I had straight A's. I think I was a graduate with a 4.0. <laughs> like, it was like, <laughs> what happened? But it really you know, made me a stronger person. And so for me, I wanted to share that with people. Like I, I made, when I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, no one knew this but myself. I never even really talked about to my parents about it. They did know I was sick, just like they knew when I had Lyme disease. I had parents so that never focused on that. They just always focused on my life going on. They never really gave me sympathy. Um, I remember one time my mother crying because she was worried about me and my dad told her to stop crying, (laughs) that (laughs) there was nothing to worry about and stop making me feel sorry for myself. And I was so mad at my father. And now I'm so thankful for that. Like, I'm, I'm so glad that I didn't just sit and lay in bed and cry for years. There were days I cried, right? There's, there were days I didn't get out of bed. Um, I have failed so many times. I went through divorce. I was with four kids alone, I was scared. And I would, you know, I remember for a couple of days, not wanting to get out of bed and then hearing my mother's voice and this inner voice saying, you got to get up, you got to produce, you've got to go on. I wanted to share that with people. If I would have listened to the people that felt sorry for me, if I would have listened to the doctors um, who said I was not, you know, that I wouldn't be okay and I couldn't go on. And if I wouldn't have looked into the research and the science behind Lyme disease and cancer and how I could do things naturally, then my life would have been significantly different. And so I really somehow wanted to share that with people because I made this promise if I lived and could raise my son, it's still hard for me to say that without crying, but if I could live and raise my son, then I was going, that's what I was going to spend the rest of my life doing. And I also had this urgency because it's kind of like I was given this gift. And at the time, it didn't feel like a gift when I got sick, right? But I, I, I was given this gift of almost dying. And so I was able to understand, you know, before that point, I had this great life. I was in a president of sorority. I was, I was involved in all this stuff. I was having fun, like going to parties. And then I got very sick. And for me, it was a wake-up call. It, it was a humbling call. It, it made me humble. It made me never be arrogant again, to be honest. And it made me understand that I have the rest of this life to do good things. And I promised myself that I would share with others and teach others what I knew. And that I would spend the rest of my life learning, being educated, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up. 
I would share this. And so Cure the Causes is about that and me trying to share that with people in case they don't have a mother and father like I did or in case they don't have that inner voice. I wanted to empower people because the truth is I feel like we're each imperfect pieces to a perfect puzzle. And without each member of our society and our population, we're not we're not as good as we could be, but we've got to empower each person so they contribute their gifts to our world. I wanted to cry just listening to you talking. <laughs> it's so true. Like I look at you and your beautiful smile and all the things you're doing to help women and empower women and people throughout the world. And I'm sure you've had challenges too. Like another thing I do understand is I'm not the only one with challenges. We all have had those dark days, those bad days. We've all had a diagnosis from a doctor or from a family member of either you're ugly, you're not pretty, or you're not smart, or you're never going to do anything, or you're sick, or you have cancer. There's always these things that go into our head. We've got to get rid of. We've got to just say, you know what? I'm going to push through that, and I'm going to be the... I'm going to be the outlier, right? That does things that someone did not diagnose. Someone did not tell the truth to. And I, it's really important to me um, that I spend the rest of my life doing that. And I think that what you are doing is amazing. So we need more women like you to stand up because imagine that at a young age, you give up. Let's just start with your parents themselves. Let's say you had bad parents that just like, yeah. Listen to the doctors and ignoring it and just telling you it is what it is, right? So your mm-hmm. life would have been a lot different than it is today. Probably me and you wouldn't be sitting here having that conversation because it wouldn't exist. Right. And I even think that like at a you know, you you grow so much the older you get. You know, when you're younger, you don't even you're always mad at your parents. <laughs> <'Cause you're> like, <laughs> they made all these mistakes, and it's true. Our parents make all you know, they're human right? They're, they're human. They all make mistakes. But you know, at my age, I, I'm so thankful for how hard they were honestly on me. And I look back and they really probably weren't that hard on me. They just wanted me to be the best I could be. Um, and I, like I said, when I got sick, I thought I may not even get to raise my son. So what do I teach him every day that he's going to be okay if I'm not here? And I really worked on that every day to teach him things anticipating that the next year I may not be there until finally it got to a point where I was like, wow, <laughs> they were wrong. I lived, you know, they were wrong. They also, like I said, tell me I would never have any other children and I have four. And so. you did. I did. They said it wasn't possible and I did. Yeah. <laughs> so now you have your, uh, your new cook, uh, you have a new book, which is the Q the Causes Cookbook. So yes. Causes Cookbook. So now what is it about? Because the you're missing tools. <laughs> yeah. So I went through different diagnoses. So I approached it from like mental health issues, from even things like ADHD, Alzheimer's, um, autism, different things like that, as well as autoimmune disorders uh, and things like Lyme disease and cancer, just a lot of different diagnoses. I, I did different um, information on different recipes and what people should eat, what people should do. I approached it from a mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health perspective. And it's probably one of my favorite books, to be honest, because there's other books out there that tell people what to eat. But this mm. is more if they have a diagnosis, you know, but this is more of also an encouragement. And I incorporated natural things into it, even some of the products I'd worked on. And the back index, it talks about ingredients and what you should take. Um, and again, some of this stuff for other countries is very normal. Like a lot of people know about black cumin seed in other countries, but they don't in the Europe and the United States. Or they know about resveratrol, but they don't in the United States or Europe. And I really wanted to educate people, too, because I want people, again, to understand that everything they put inside their body is important. There's a city inside this body <laughs> and the cells talk. And I don't know if people understand that, but as a nanobiotechnologist, I understand that you can cut off the communication, like I said earlier, with the bad cells so they don't grow and support the good cells. And so the purpose of this book is to really teach people because I feel like you can read the Cure the Causes book, but what step-by-step approach do you take? And if any if people are like me, they need guidance, right? Um, and so I wanted to share some of the education that I have. 
uh, and how I could, you know, how this could help other people, even giving them different recipes, which they can alter, but that they can take to really support their bodies getting better. And again, this is all about each person being the best they can be and encouraging each, each life and not focusing just on a diagnosis, but instead on how can I naturally get my body out of that diagnosis. And like I was diagnosed one time with rheumatoid arthritis, actually more than once, because after Lyme disease, my hands were swollen multiple times, rheumatoid arthritis, but you see me and I I don't look like I have rheumatoid arthritis. If I would have listened to the doctors, I would have been on IV infusions every day. And again, there's some people that need that, but I would encourage people to first look. And even if you have a diagnosis and you're on medication, please incorporate natural things. Please incorporate things like acupuncture and chiropractic care and massages and natural products and great organic ingredients and things that are healthy into your diet instead of just eating preservatives. Because the truth is all those preservatives we eat, like in the United States, they're full of GMOs and they're full of toxins, but yet we keep putting them into our bodies and we don't understand that. And so I really This cookbook really goes into all those details and really also encourages people, again, to love who they are and to support their body and to accept the thing, the fact that, yes, we're all different. And yes, our world does give diagnosis based on uh, what they think is happening, but it's not a end all at all. And not don't just listen to that. Make your body better. Get your body out of that diagnosis And I think that's important. I had two kids diagnosed with autism and they're perfect. They went to school. They did great. They were hugely successful in life. Amazing kids. If I would have listened to those doctors and not worked with them individually on how to be the best person that they could be, then they wouldn't end up being that way. And even even my husband, Clay, encourages me because he was in kindergarten and pre-K and they, they put him in a special education because he couldn't sit still because he had extreme ADHD and his mother was telling me about it. And she went to the school and I respect her a lot for this. She said, he does not, he doesn't need to be in special education. I'm going to have him in regular classes. And then my husband's extremely brilliant. And, you know, he just was a little boy that didn't want to sit still. So again, this cookbook approaches all those topics and it doesn't make people feel bad. If you have a diagnosis and your kids have to go to a special school, it's fine, but encourage your kids that they're not weird or they're not, there's not something wrong with them. They just think differently. They process things differently. Right. And that's something that's hugely important to me. I feel like our mental health is so bad right now in our world. We have a crisis, you know, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. We just had a shooting last week and all these crises are a result again of people not loving their own lives and also the people around them, not supporting them. When you eat, It's a time of breaking bread and community, right? And I wanted this book to be able to touch each person and the community around them so that they could cook healthy meals. As a mother, I love cooking or I love ordering even food into the house. But I think it's really important that people understand when you break bread together or you eat together, you're a community, you're sharing things. So hopefully this cookbook will bring some really great conversational pieces and extra love into people's homes because they're feeding people really good food. (sighs) (laughs) It's um, a lot of things when you say them, they are like, you're right. And I send them, I leave some of them. And, um, but when you talk about your, your husband as a, as a little boy that wouldn't want to sit still, that remind me of my son in kindergarten. (laughs) It's it's all the, which has been putting a lot of, been given a lot of names that we do not deserve. Right. I I got called to the principal's office with each of my boys and I got, because they wouldn't sit still in class, right? Because they, they were just very hyper. They're athletes. They're very active and the teachers weren't even that nice to them. And I, I, my mom's a teacher. My sister's a teacher. I love teachers, but they didn't treat them very well. Mm -hmm. And they gave these diagnoses of ADHD, autism, you know, all these different things. And I simply, again, you can tell my personality. I just said, you know what? They're fine. That's what I said. They're going to be fine. And they don't need to be in your class if you don't treat them like a normal human being. And so I, I I know you said you have a son and I'm just telling you, don't worry when people get, don't worry when they tell you. I don't. 
<laughs> I don't. One teacher said that um, when my son went to preschool and um, he was the only child in preschool that's capable of writing his entire name by himself and be able to write the entire alphabet and can write from 100, from one to 100 and be do the plus and multipl- multiplication. And he will do them so fast and he's done. He's just waiting for the rest of the class and they struggle because they can't. And the teacher will move him to the back of the room. Yeah. yeah. And that was very bad for him because he will complain about it because he sit there for like two, three hours. He has nothing else to do. Right. And he doesn't want to sit still for two to three hours. I mean, no. I even, and you know, this, this is, and I approach this and cure the causes and I talk about it a little bit in the cookbook as well. Um, my daughter, you know, she has a gift of drawing and doing things. And I kind of had a similar gift. So we were called to the, the office for her because they said she was cheating because there was no way she drew the pictures. So we just sit her down and we had to have her draw in front of them. And I was so angry. And I'm sure you know this as a mother. I was angry for them making an accusation that wasn't true. I feel the same way about a diagnosis. It's not accurate. We have all these people labeling us in this world. Yes. And again, you can't put a label on a person that no one else is like them. There's no one with your same DNA. There's no one with your same blood type and same genetics. Each person's different. So again, don't let people give you labels. Be who you are meant to be and be proud of it. And don't let people bully you or be unkind because of it. And I think that's, again, one of the biggest messages that I hope I get across in the book. And we have an inspiration book that's coming out that I even address that more with. <laughs> I look forward to reading both of your books and the new one as well. I have one last question for you before I let you go. You have recently launched a global scientific runway fashion and art series titled Under the Red Chandelier. Can you tell us more about this project and what inspired you to combine science and fashion together? Yeah, so I'm an artist. My mother's a musician. I love fashion. Um, I have a I have a closet that's two levels. It has a spiral uh, staircase. My husband built that goes to a top level, and it has this really big red chandelier. And I just got really tired of everyone labeling me as a scientist and not understanding that I also liked all these other things. And traveling throughout the world, I had exposure to amazing fashion designers, amazing art, music. And I developed this company called Under the Red Chandelier with a podcast series that highlights, like if I'm in Monaco and I meet with the Prince, we do different podcasts, stuff like that. Through that, I ended up developing a clothing line that protects the body from environmental toxins, um, Mm -hmm. pollution and nuclear waste, as well as 5G technology and all the things that are harmful for us. And we launched that at Fashion Week. It was one of the top stories. And that, that particular launch was really important to me. I did an animal line, a children's line, and an adult line, and we'll have the full line available this summer. But it was really important because I wanted to show that science can be fun. Science can be sexy. It can be whatever you want it to be. Don't label because I'm a scientist that I can't do these other things. Because I believe, again, as women, and I'm sure you're this way because you have such a vibrant personality. There's so many different parts of you, right? That, that, you have to get to know you to, to know all of them. And again, this was my way of really supporting people, regardless of their belief, regardless of their religion, regardless of where they come from. We all need to understand we share each other's DNA. And it's okay to love art and music and fashion. fashion. <laughs> I mean, I'm, and I, one day I said, because I work with mostly men, and I said, listen, this is what I like. And that's okay. And I'm not embarrassed that I do like this. And let's, let's do this the right way. And thankfully, I have people around me like my family and Lisa Kreitz and all these people on our corporate team that supported me. And actually, I think that has gotten more press than the science stuff that I've done, <laughs> the, the fashion line. So we're going to do some stuff in the Hamptons and we're going to do even more fashion shows. And again, my goal is to bring education into empowerment of women. And I think you are only doing that, not just to the products you created, to um, the, the work you're doing to support or share it is. And I know you've done a lot of that. And it's, it's through your books, even when you go talking. So you are only doing it. You are an amazing woman that's doing great things. And that, thank you for that. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. And we, we do have a foundation called the ROM Foundation where we offer mentorship programs for high school and college students. So if anyone's interested in that, what we love to do is mentor because I do think that's another thing we don't do enough of. We've got a, 
empower each other for free, right? We've got yes. to encourage and teach people. Because if you look at history, like um, you, you shared with me what country you're from, when you grow up on a farm, like I grew up on a farm in the United States, they teach you how to farm, right? And how to plant and how to do all of that. In our world, we're not teaching people how to do business. We're not teaching them how to be better than we are. And so another goal of our organization is to help people be better than we are so that future generations can be not just sustainable, but better than we are right now. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Dr. Ram, for giving me the chance to talk to you. It was a great privilege. And I appreciate all the work that you are doing to support not just women, but everyone else in the world. And uh, as women, we need that the most because we are struggling right now, especially after COVID. So please keep paving the path for us because we need women like you to keep on doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I enjoyed today. Um, I really did. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmail.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.